Hi, everybody. Hi, Luca. I got late to the party, but I see that you are ready. We are live now. <laughs> so maybe I should start by, by uh, introducing. Um, welcome to the, the Science of Pandemic Tech seminar series. Um, this is an event that we hold monthly um, and the idea is, you know, we are trying to do, to respond. We hope to be an audience of doers who are doing things in public health, who are doing things in tech to respond to COVID um, and who need to be informed about the latest science as they do so, so that we can have as science-based actions as possible. Uh, so the series is put on by uh, jointly by, by WeHealth and by the University of Oxford Big Data Institute and hosted by me and by Luca Ferretti. Um, and we try to be interdisciplinary and figure out how, how we can fight infectious disease. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joanna Maisel. I am a mathematical modeler and data scientist who did many things before pivoting during a pandemic to try and work on that. Um, but more importantly, uh, our speakers today um, are from the, the German exposure notification team, uh, Corona Barnup, and uh, I'm really excited about their talk in general. I'm excited about the German uh, app. Uh, whenever we at WeHealth uh, have, think we have a great idea and this and that, we often check and, oh, the Germans already did that and can we copy how? And then they have beautiful documentation up on GitHub and they really lead the way in a lot of things and they're just, you know, exemplary implementation and really thinking ahead and, and doing a, a magnificent job. And I'm particularly excited now to hear about the evaluation and really cutting edge analytics that I think that they're the first people to do. Um, and we all wanna know the answer to, to, to what they find. Um, so there's three speakers we have. We have Goran Kishner, who's more from, uh, you know, the hardcore mathematics uh, originally before the Ebola outbreak, where he pivoted to uh, more practical work of, of, of surveillance and reporting. And, um, and now, of course, uh, COVID as well. Uh, Justus Benzler, whose background is uh, more medical and epidemiological, um, and who has also worked on other pandemics before. This is not his first pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, and has been instrumental in, in the early stages of the whole idea of privacy preserving digital contact tracing. And uh, Tim Weirach, who uh, takes more of the, the social science aspect into this, and I think is really going to tell us about. Uh, how to tell whether something's working in the real world, um, how to collect data uh, that, will, that will really inform what impact all of this is having taking place. So before I turn it over to them, I want to plug the next month's event. Next month's event will be uh, in my original home discipline of evolutionary biology. Uh, we will have uh, Katrina Lithgow and Tyler Starr um, from uh, Katrina Lithgow from her own lab, Tyler Starr from Jesse Bloom's lab. And they'll, I think we all want to know uh, what's happening with new variants and also what's likely to happen in the future with new variants. And I think these two speakers are really perfect for, uh, like, you, know, bring, you know, for really briefing us all at the cutting edge of that. Uh, so now I would like to turn it over to the Corona Varnap team. Yes, thank you, Joanna, for those um, nice introductory words. I don't think that we are actually the first in, in many things. We are rather late in, in some of uh, the, the additions that we bring uh, to the proximity tracing apps. Um, but we are very happy that we have the opportunity to um, share something of that with you now. And I'm trying to share my screen here and hope that this will work. Um, does it? Looks good. Yep. OK. So um, as a title, we've chosen, does it really work? And uh, about collecting data on the German Corona One ads through event-driven user surveys and privacy-preserving analytics. That's the two um, 
let's say, tools or instruments that we want to focus on today and um, on its methodology, the changes and the early findings. Um, but before we come to that, we want to give you a little bit of an introduction of the German Corona Warn app with an emphasis not on the standard features of proximity tracing apps that you probably know, but on some particularities of the German app and especially on those that impact on the contents of the features that we present them in the second and the third part of the presentation that is this privacy preserving analytics and the event driven user surveys. Um, on the privacy preserving analytics, we haven't um, analyzed uh, a lot yet. Um, so when we come to findings and result, it will rather be about the event driven user survey that we can present. Okay, so the German Corona One app uh, was launched in June 2020. In line with many other proximity tracing apps, it uses the Google Apple exposure notification framework. And epidemiological monitoring, what we will talk about today, was explicitly not one of its purposes, in the beginning at least. Uh, because in addition to the centralized concept of the Google Apple export notification framework, its um, disconnection from epidemiological monitoring was favored by two early principles. One was minimal interaction with the user, because um, we thought, well, the user should actually take note of the app when he or she is doing a test and then decides to register this test in the app or when there is a um, notification coming up. But um, otherwise, they should really not um, uh, note the app. And those were rare events in the early days of the pandemic. So most users would only rarely get aware that they had actually installed the app. And the other one was a minimal interaction with the public health services. That means um, the app should not add to the anyway very high workload of the local health authorities. And there was no integration in the concept of it, uh, no integration with the conventional um, contact tracing. So a user's receiving a positive PCR test result on exposure notification, they were not encouraged uh, to contact their local health authority. But as soon as the app was launched, the public debate about its effectiveness started and users were thinking, well, I installed it, now I don't see anything happening and they were not sure whether it was really working. Local health authorities, they were saying, sometimes complaining, well, we are not involved, we get no data from it, nobody calls us, and if somebody calls who had received, for example, notification on the app, we don't know what to say and what to recommend because we don't know a lot about the circumstances of that. Then we have an overseeing authority that is a federal commissioner for data perfect, uh, protection and freedom of information. And um, while uh, they had, um, we, so it all had to be very, let's say, uh, day, um, data sparsity, as they also wanted us to prove that the app fulfills its purpose. And so we needed evidence um, to show that because fulfilling the purpose was necessary to, um, to show that actually the risk to data protection that were involved with the app were worth having them. And politi politi politicians were just saying, well, if you want to know whether it works, look at the downloads. But um, when we look at the downloads and here we have the number, um, uh, numbers from the app stores, the play store and combined cumulative downloads, we see it over the time always going up. Yeah, and these are um, in our view over optimistic numbers. Um, so when we want to compare cumulative downloads to active users, which is actually the measurement that's more interesting here, we think cumulative downloads are always going up numbers of active users probably are not always going up. We don't know exactly what's counted there. We know there are different approaches in the App Store and in the Google Play Store on what they count. Um, there are also counts of monthly active users in it, but those are much lower. 
but there again, we don't know exactly what's counted. Um, for instance, if the app really does its job entirely in the background, as it often does, is that counted? Does it count at the monthly active user in the um, app and Play Store statistics? Then there is some um, uh, concern about the numbers of users compared to devices, compared to accounts. We come to some of that later in our findings. And um, also users may have actually installed the app and even use it, but they do it for other purposes than the intended core function of, uh, of warning others. And that is, for example, the purpose of receiving test results quickly. So here you see a typical advertisement for the app from the early times. Well, it's in German, but it translates in fastest way to getting your test result. And that was a um, reason and a motivation for many people to actually download it, install it, and, and run it just to get their, their test result. Um, so the best proxy for active users would be the daily count of key downloads by distinct app instances, as some of the other proximity tracing apps in other countries have done it. We know it, for example, from our Swiss colleagues, um, how they uh, did it. But this is a key performance indicator that's not available in Germany for technical and uh, legal reasons, at least not yet. Um, so here I do a small excurse about um, how we got some of the data um, we were dealing with, and that is this lab process, with, which is also a little bit special in the German app because um, we had uh, that as an additional feature from the very early days onwards, that laboratories performing PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2 were integrated into the ecosystem of the app. About um, 220 labs are currently connected, and connected means users can register their PCR test in the app by scanning a QR code that um, looks like that. So that's a paper form that's used there, and um, you have to scan the QR code um, down here. You have to click this, uh, check this box, um, giving your OK that it's um, uh, processed by the CVR, and then off you go. The lab sends the test result to a server, and um, the app uh, queries the server regularly until they receive, um, and they match the results that they find there with their, um, their ID. And when they can match it, it's uh, displaced uh, to the user, it's displayed to the user, already verified. So you can use this um, test result to um, submit your diagnosis key for exposure notification if you decide to do so. And according to our accounts, we do a national SARS-CoV-2 test monitoring. This covers approximately two thirds of all eligible labs in Germany and 80% of our national PCR testing capacity which goes through this uh, way. So the two sides of the medal are that um, a fair proportion of the users had actually downloaded the app for this purpose and not for the main purpose of notifying others. That was especially true at the end of the 2020 holiday season when PCR testing sites were established in many points of entries, airports, railway stations, um, highway border crossings, for example, and um, the app was advertised there as well. And the good side is that this gives us um, some of the data we will talk about right now. So in total, we had uh, more than 40 million tests that were delivered through the um, app's ecosystem. And um, we had uh, slightly more than 450,000 users that were submitting diagnosis keys. Um, their diagnosis keys based on that. And when you, we look on the details of it, um, then we see, again, the 40 million tests and uh, 650,000 of those were positive, which is a positivity rate of 4.6%. In total, we had, um, uh, since September 2020, 3.3 million lab confirmed cases in Germany. So we're talking about slightly more than 20% of them here. And um, uh, of the, uh, let's see, of those um, 365,000 um, actually submitted their keys, which are 
57%, so a little bit more than half of those who received in the app. And there were another 90,000 that um, submitted it using a Teleton, so-called Teleton, that is a number, um, a pin that's issued by a hotline that you can call if you receive a positive PCR test outside of the CVR um, ecosystem and you decide to submit your keys nevertheless. Then you uh, talk to that hotline, you explain to them um, that you got this test and you say, let's say increase the probability that you are telling um, the right story here, then they give you the, the issue, the number and you upload your test with that. Um, so in total 455,000 uh, diagnosis keys submitted. And um, coming back from this X curse of the lab system, I want to quickly show you some uh, more of the features of the, of the app. So we already talked about the proximity tracing. We already talked about the availability of verified PCR testing results within the app. Um, we also uh, had then the EU interoperability, the European interoperability. Uh, that means that many of the European proximity tracing apps, uh, which are based on the Google Apple Exposure Notification Framework, can exchange through a federal European federal gateway, um, even between countries. So if you are traveling uh, in a different country, you can still exchange with the app users of those countries um, your keys. Then we decided at some stage to show more what we call low risk exposure notifications. Um, to the app users that was at that stage when people said, well, the app is actually not working. I never see any notification here um, that were green notifications like that, just telling you that you had an exposure, but which did not go beyond a certain risk threshold. Uh, threshold and it would give you the usual guidelines um, that you had to follow anyway. Um, then we integrated uh, rapid antigen tests and um, you could then get um, this test result as well in your app and use that for warning as well. Here you also see that further process when you get the positive result, you can then enter uh, symptoms, your symptom status, uh, the onset of symptoms and all this is used um, to calculate your particular um, risk or the, the risk that you might infect others um, uh, on a particular day. And that's linked then to the um, diagnosis key of that day. We also um, included a contact diary where you could keep track of uh, your contacts yourself in entering um, people that you met, entering places uh, where you've been and where you encountered other people. And uh, that is shown in your uh, journal together with the risk statements for particular days. And um, when you are going back to your local house authority, that what you were supposed then later on to do more, uh, more regularly than in the beginning, um, you could actually export this and um, further edit it if you like and submit it to the local house authority so that they had a basis for their conventional contact tracing as well. Then we added um, in-app statistics, uh, indicators, um, parameters like the confirmed new infections, the warning by app users, the seven-day incident, seven-day R value. So some um, indicators that come from outside the app, some indicators that came from inside the app. And that would look like, like this. Um, then we added uh, location and event check-in, so uh, presence tracing or for indoor, for covering indoor um, encounters better than we did uh, before or better than it's done by the Bluetooth uh, signal. That looks like this, so you could... Um, oop. Well, I hope I'm not... Um, thrown out of the system here because uh, at RKI after 10 hours, we are thrown out of the system. I would have to log on quickly again. Let's see. Um, so uh, you could uh, check in to a place or to an event and, um, and you could also record that in your uh, contact diary or contact journal. 
Then we had the personalized um, display of verified negative um, uh, rapid antigen tests that would look like that. So it would also give your name and your, if you decide to do that, give your name and your birth date with it and um, count up how much time had actually passed since you uh, did that test. Um, finally, we are currently working on the so-called EU Digital Green Pass or the EU COVID-19 certificate, uh, which um, uh, involves the vaccination certificates, recovery certificate and negative test certificate um, to make it easier to travel between European countries again. Okay, with that, I come to the uh, first uh, main point here, which is the privacy preserving analytics that's activated since um, March 21 in our system and uh, users can consent that their app sends daily operational data to a server that happens um, in an autonomous, uh, uh, anonymous way um, but authenticated, that means um, we are using a service which is called privacy preserving access control that does a device check. And it basically makes sure that you're running a Genian um, uh, instance of the app on a Genian smartphone or Genian device. And it also has a rate limitation so that you can upload your data only, only once and not um, somehow troll the system by repeated uploads. Uh, further documentation on that you can see at those links that I provide here. We have um, four main data sets in that. So one is the exposure risk metadata, which is created and sent, and sent once daily at a random time. It is uh, giving information about the current exposure risks, um, so the prevalence of risk in a way. In the beginning, it is equivalent on what is displayed on your risk card on your um, home screen. Uh, now we are currently differentiating that between um, risk based on proximity tracing and risk based on presence tracing. And also it gives information whether that has changed since the previous submission. So usually the previous day. So about the incidence of new risks uh, uh, notifications coming up here. Then we have the test result metadata data set, um, which is created when you register a test and it's sent with the next um, daily submission when you retrieve a result or if you haven't retrieved a result after um, seven days. We have a key submission metadata set, which is created when you retrieve a positive test a result and um, it is sent with the next uh, daily submission when you have submitted your diagnosis keys or if you have not submitted them after 36 hours. And we have data sets about new exposure windows. So we continuously collect information on exposure windows um, and those that have not been submitted with a previous submission are submitted with the next one. There are also um, some data on the user, the client, and um, so means the phone and some technical metadata, which are appended to some of the other data sets. This technical metadata um, has the submission date in it, um, the authorization information, so a token as a misuse precaution, um, the client metadata, uh, the version of the app that you're running, the version of the operating system that you are using. And for the user metadata, you can choose optionally to provide three uh, kinds of information. One is um, the federal state and the administrative unit, which is more or less a German equivalent of a county where you're living in and um, your age group, very coarse, that means are you under 30, 30 to 60 or older? than 60. So that's the screen where you can provide that information. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'm just thrown out of the system here. So I have to um, quickly uh, get onto it again.
So meantime, I'll just step in with a reminder yeah. that you can <laughs> yeah, use sorry. the Q&A and that you can upvote and downvote our questions. And maybe while Justice is doing that, then we can take the first question uh, and have somebody else answer it. And that's from uh, Jeff Burpee. Uh, how were you able to get a higher engagement in trust for encouraging users to submit their positive exposure keys? Can somebody take that one? Preferably not Justus because he's busy. Well, as already noted, I'm more on the uh, social side of this process. So maybe Guran can explain something regarding the question. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's not only a technical uh, part, uh, the reason that we, we uh, get to such a high engagement. I think also uh, our openness meaning um, that we have everything uh, shared on uh, in the open source community is, is also a good hint um, to answer that question. I mean, I think, the, I, I think the 57% yeah? is similar, to, is, is just basically the same as what we actually had at the University of Arizona. I know the UK was higher at 70 2% or something, and a lot of places are lower. My sense is the ease of use <laughs> has a lot to do with it as well. It's not just about engagement and trust. It's also the user experience and the workflow of how easy it is to do it. And the test integration that you have, in my opinion, is part of why you have uh, something on the higher side. Luca looks like he has thoughts. <laughs> Test integration is key, and I think a good test integration makes it much, much easier. And I think this has been uh, probably one of the advantages of, uh, of the NHS app uh, and maybe possibly also of, this, of the of Corona Warm app. Yeah, and, it, and our app has a more limited test integration, but it's still a test integration. And, and we saw before and after the test integration, dramatic change in, in diagnosis key submission. Um, the, the, the test integration we did do was, was critical. Okay, Justus, you're back? Yes, I'm back. You see my screen again? Yes. <laughs> okay, you hear me again? Good, so, sorry for that. We just have this um, settings that uh, after 10 hours, you are locked out of your, of your system. And as it's evening now here in Germany, um, I had reached that 10 hour limit and I wasn't aware that that would happen just uh, at the time of our presentation and I couldn't uh, couldn't um, get to this presentation during that time. Okay, let's see whether we can continue here. Um, I already talked about this exposure risk metadata set, um, which is now differentiated for proximity tracing and presence tracing. Um, telling about the risk level that you see, whether it changed the most recent date of that risk level. And that is what um, on the screen you see in those places here. So this is a red card displayed and it tells you if you had an exposure on which day that exposure was, if you had several exposures and which day the last relevant exposure had taken place. Um, then on the test result, uh, metadata, we are looking at the actual result, again, differentiated for rapid test or PCR test, the hours passed since test registration, the risk level that was displayed at the test registration, um, the delay from the most recent notified exposure to the test registration in days and the delay from the exposure notification, that means when you see it, to the test registration in hours. Then for the key submission, whether it actually was submitted, whether it was submitted after the symptom flow, so whether you went through that because you could skip it, whether it was submitted with a teleton or with a um, verification that came from within the system, a new now whether it's submitted after a rapid antigen test, the, again, the delay hours since the test result retrieval and hours since test registration. Uh, the user data, technical metadata attached to it. 
and um, a second data set separated from the other one with the technical metadata was looking whether it was submitted uh, in background, um, whether you had canceled the submission flow, again, whether it was after the symptom flow, whether you had given advanced consent or consent at the time of uploading it, because you have the possibility to give an advanced consent um, at the time when you do a test, when you register a test, and that's valid for five days. Um, and also the last screen that you had on your phone when you actually did the submission. So whether it was the test result, whether it was a screen about warning others, the symptom screen or about the onset of symptoms, um, that all helps us to better understand um, how this submission goes and what it means uh, for the user and how the user deals with that. Um, regarding the exposure windows, um, we collect the date the transmission risk level that comes with it. Um, in Germany, we have a very fine um, degrees or grading of transmission risk, so a total of six uh, levels that we distinguish. The calibration confidence of the signal, the normalized exposure time, and normalized means um, we weight times in different attenuation buckets um, differently, as I think most of you do as well. And then the actual array of the scan instances with the typical attenuation, the minimal attenuation, and the seconds since the, that passed since the last scan. And um, here, some data on it. So that is uh, the number of um, devices participating in that um, privacy preserving analytics per day. And we had over the last, um, weeks, an average of um, 7 million devices submitting a daily data set. And here, one very first analysis that we did with that, and that was looking how many warnings actually were, how many exposure notifications were seen by users compared to, um, the, to the numbers of devices that did key uploads. And um, you see the numbers uh, in red of the red warnings or high risk warnings in blue, uh, which are the green warnings meant to be green. Um, so the low risk uh, notifications and the total number of them. And, and here you have, see some big peaks that was when we did some parameter changes and um, uh, many additional green warnings uh, were played out at that time because they always cover 14 days backwards. So you can get um, a whole flood of them if you had low risk encounters um, over the last 14 days and, and they all show up now at this time. Okay, and with that, I'll hand over uh, to Tim. Thank you very much, Jussus. So I will now further introduce uh... EDIS, which is, as you all heard by now, short for Event Driven User Survey. I will first introduce the survey in principle and then later present the questions we ask and first uni variant description, descriptive results. Uh, regarding the time limit, I will try to be uh, brief. So, what is uh, EDIS? As the name suggests, first and foremost, it's a survey for the users of the Corona Barn app which is triggered by a specific event in the app. Um, the specific event is when the app notifies the user of a high risk exposure. Uh, functionality of the app just uh, already showed you and that we also call a red tile because of the way the notification looks. Um, so the basic idea behind this uh, evaluation approach was to provide a link to a survey for users who have had a high risk notification so that they can take part in a survey, a survey that was divided into two questionnaires, uh, an initial one and a follow-up questionnaire five days after they completed the first one. The first questionnaire dealt uh, with questions on the user's perception of this high risk notification, their prior behavior and further intentions. In addition, questions were asked about uh, social demographics, specifically gender, age, region of uh, residence, and high school education degree achieved. At the end of the initial questionnaire, the respondents could agree to also participate in the follow-up by giving out their email address to us. 
like I said, the follow-up survey took place five days later and uh, focused on actual behavior changes uh, due to the high-risk notification and particularly about uh, PCR or rapid antigen tests done following the notification and their respective results. Um, the questionnaires were discussed with various external bodies, for example, scientists from universities and professional societies in the field of health and uh, social research. On the right side of the screen right now, you can see a screenshot of what the questionnaire looked like on the phone, um, which is the place where the questionnaires were most likely to be answered. This one uh, right here is um, a question from the follow-up questionnaire. Uh, yes, so right away we have to report uh, one minor limitation up front. Uh, we could only offer the survey in German language, even if the app can be used in a, a variety of languages. So we decided to do this in order to get the survey underway uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so let's look at the technical process in more detail. Right away, another short disclaimer, uh, none of us uh, right here were directly involved in the technical implementation itself. So I will go through the concept of, of, uh, of how it works, but I won't cover every detail. If there are further questions uh, regarding the technical side of this process, we gladly will take those questions with us, uh, discuss them with the IT team and can come back to you uh, with an answer at a later point. So from a, a kind of front, act, front end perspective, when a high risk notification uh, was displayed in the app, the users were offered a link to a landing page of a survey service uh, with corresponding explanation of the survey in addition to the regular process of informing the user on how to behave uh, with this uh, increased risk of exposure to the virus. Um, yeah, on oh. this, <laughs> not yet. Uh, there the users were asked to provide the correspond uh, corresponding declaration of consent before the survey could start. The online survey itself then was conducted via the uh, RKE's internal central survey software called VoxCore, which uh, you will hear again in the slides. Uh, to ensure the protection of privacy and to prevent misuse, uh, there were some technical processes necessary which you see here, um, or the concept of which you can see here. Um, we did this because in other surveys, we have unfortunately had to deal with the fact that uh, survey links were posted in, for example, forums, and a lot of implausible answers were generated. Um, so when the status display with the link to the online survey was shown, the uh, app created a one-time password and stored it on the smartphone itself. If the user clicked on the link to the survey, proof of authenticity was requested from the operating system um, to verify that the device was genuine and the app uh, was installed, in fact. The proof of authenticity and the uh, OTP, the one-time password, were then transferred from the smartphone uh, to the app server. If the proof of authenticity was successfully verified, the user was forwarded to the survey itself and the data was saved. If the user participated in this survey, the uh, one-time password was deactivated to prevent the user from participating in the survey again, um, or uh, the link being forwarded to unauthorized persons. Um, at the end of the basic survey, an email address was requested in order to enable the sending of the participation link for the follow-up survey. So a more traditional approach for the follow-up survey. All participants have had the opportunity to decide whether or not to participate. Um, the email address is stored uh, on a separate database uh, using a special um, uh, procedure called to secure. And yeah, the link to the follow-up survey then was sent automatically by email to participants who have pro provided an email address uh, and like I said, five days later after the initial questionnaire. Um, the email addresses were deleted right after the invitation uh, uh, was sent. Um, uh, yeah, I will skip the point about the data automatically, uh, automatically collected by Voxco systems looking at the time. The gist of it is 
at uh, all uh, relevant, uh, all data relevant to data protection laws were deleted uh, at the end of the web sessions, uh, which means by uh, appropriate database triggers. So next slide, please. So um, after hopefully clearing up the technical process, underlining the survey, I will say a few more basic things about the survey itself. The survey, or more precisely the initial questionnaire, went online on March the 4th of this year. The option to participate in the initial questionnaire was terminated uh, on the software side on May the 7th. Given that respondents get uh, invited to the follow-up five days after the participation in the initial questionnaire, and that they have 14 days to answer, the true end date of the survey will be in the future in uh, May the May 26th. So technically the survey is still in the field even when there are no new invitations being sent right now. Um, including the, uh, one step back please, thank you. Including the questions for social demographics and the requests uh, for an email address, um, there are 30 questions uh, across both questionnaires um, in total, with the initial one uh, where social demographics were being asked having 22 of them. Um, one question about the number of devices the respondents use the app on was implemented uh, later into the server lifetime on April the 7th, but we will see that uh, next slide, please. So let's take a, a first, a, a really first look at the response uh, of the initial questionnaire. Uh, the response data and characteristics that we can report today uh, as the preliminary, because we have not yet been able to clarify certain details with all the internal and external people and stakeholders involved, and because the survey is uh, only just being completed. We are therefore, for example, still lacking certain software-related insights to be able to report the response with uh, yeah, more scientific certainty. Nevertheless, I will try to give a first uh, insight. Regarding the initial questionnaire, 26,094 respondents completed the questionnaire, which means that they reached the end and not that they answered every single question. Uh, what you can see uh, here is a distribution of uh, response frequencies per day for the initial questionnaire. Um, I already explained the uh, completed cases here at the light green light line. Uh, drop means all records uh, that either got a session timeout after 13 minutes of inactivity or who closed the questionnaire in between and then after 30 minutes also got a session timeout. Uh, screened out are those who clicked uh, on it, uh, clicked on I do not want to participate uh, at the declaration of consent. So in other words, the uh, refusers. Out of quota is a bit more complicated and happens if the participant participation link is invalid or has been transferred incorrectly to the service service. This could happen if someone uh, skipped the landing page of the questionnaire uh, by being inside of the questionnaire once and then um, letting the session expire, reloading the page via the browser. And as you can see, not a really good, uh, not a really great problem. So um, the survey started on March 4th. And for about two weeks, we had uh, less response than we had anticipated. Uh, by March 19, the response rises sharply. Uh, so far, we have a few theories as, to, uh, uh, theories as to why, but cannot yet explain the, the sharp increase with uh, absolute certainty. At this time, there were updates um, to the risk calculation being rolled out to the app users. Um, the new risk calculation method, uh, for example, uh, reduced the duration of what is considered the critical encounter from 13 to nine minutes. So it is likely that more people got a high risk notification and therefore more people were able to participate in this survey. Uh, the fluctuations you can see afterwards can partly be explained by weekly effects and uh, less, as less testing is done on weekends and therefore less positive test results are shared. Likewise, part of the total variance can maybe be attributed to the development of the incidence at that time as it increased steadily in Germany uh, until around end of April. Um, of course, yeah, the response drops when the invitations were um, being stopped. Um, just as good to click once again, thank you. The few respondents that still uh, answered the day after 
did not get the rollout uh, ending the invitation on time, we think, but this is a factor among the others that has to be clarified in uh, future analysis. Uh, considering all this, we have a completion rate of about 77%, which means that 77% of people who followed the invitation completed the questionnaire. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, looking at the response for the follow-up questionnaire, we see no major differences in response behavior uh, here. Unused, uh, um, may, um, the unused uh, line means uh, the following um, for all users who have specified a mail in the initial questionnaire a record was created if this was not, if this record was not used it shows up here as unused uh, sent mail means the count of emails sent per given day uh, since there are no major uh, variations to the response of the initial questionnaire uh, we can go through here click uh, quickly so the follow-up started five days later uh, on march uh, 9 uh, next, we see the rise in response five days after the rise of the rise of the response in the initial questionnaire, and analogous to the first survey, the response falls five days after the invitations were stopped. Uh, here we have a completion rate of seventy-four percent, so a bit less. All right, so let's take a look uh, at the study population in uh, kind of a comparison to the general population in Germany. Uh, here, can, here you can see the proportions and the differences of uh, those between the people we reached and the general population divided into sex. We, uh, to clarify, we surveyed gender across two questions. One asked about the gender which was uh, entered on the birth certificate. Since not all people feel they belong to uh, this gender, we also asked which gender the respondents felt they belong to. For this comparison, we used the gender from the birth certificate, as this is the only way uh, we have comparative data on the population as a whole. Uh, as you can see, there is some variation when comparing the two. The uh, apps consent from uh, the apps uh, consent form specifies that the app should only be used by people over the age of 16. Therefore, the under 18s are heavily underrepresented here, which is uh, good in this case, as otherwise we might have a privacy problem. Further, the app based uh, uh, survey was completed by fewer people over 18 year, uh, 80 years. Um, the difference to the total population is therefore due to the access mode. Uh, fewer people of older generation use smartphones than younger people. And then we still see a strong overrepresentation of women for the age groups between 18 and 59, about, and less so for this uh, uh, 62, 69 years old, while the overrepresentation of males starts at the age groups of the uh, above 30 year olds. Uh, next slide, please. So, in terms of education, there's also an overrepresentation of people with high school qualifications and under representation of people with lower school qualification, which is to be expected. We also see similar effects in other survey uh, designs and other survey formats. The circle of the center shows the distribution of the total population. The other one shows the education of the study population. Um, at a later time, we will try to assess how large the bias is compared to other studies or whether the study design has particular implications um, yes, um, we'll talk about that in summary on the next slide, please. So in summary, we, ha uh, we have some biases in the data. People with higher education qualifications are overrepresented. Likewise, uh, people in the younger age groups from 18 onwards, although there are differences between the sexes. It is important to keep in mind that the app users differ from the general population and that there are probably also systematic differences between all app users and those who participated in this survey. So all in all, we surveyed um, the subpopulation of the subpopulation, if you will, so making um, the differences and the effects uh, clearer is also a task uh, for the new future. So next slide, please. Uh, so let's get started with the questions. I'll start with the question from the initial questionnaire. Um, this is the question I talked about before uh, that we implemented later. We asked how many devices the respondents have the app installed on. Here you can see a possible further minor limitation because we could not rule out that people who have more than one device 
also get more than one high risk notification, uh, what would have enabled them to participate more than once in the survey. But from the looks of it, the app is used uh, primary on one device, 90% state that. If we estimate the average number of devices, we arrive at about 1.1 uh, devices per participant. Next slide, please. So we stay with the user's um, interaction with the app and look here at whether the users had activated the risk detection in the last 14 days. Uh, there's something, uh, uh, there's half uh, written in square brackets here that was not in the original questions because we noticed that the question could potentially be misunderstood by the participants. The question was meant to ask if the risk detection had been activated during the last 14 days. However, the question could also be understood to mean that the risk detection had been activated again in the last 14 days. Um, this because there should not actually be the 1.1% who indicated no, as you can see here, since users who, uh, since users with risk detection switched off could not receive a red tile and thus no invitation. Uh, all in all, over, overwhelmingly, majority has had the risk detection activated consistently 14 days before filling out the questionnaire. So next slide, please. Next, we wanted to know um, more about the high risk notification itself uh, or how it was handled, in particular, wh whether uh, it came as a surprise and if not, why not? Um, yeah, we, we interpret the data you can see here in the direction that the app can help break infectious chains by identifying infection risk that would otherwise go unaccounted for. 37% of the respondents were surprised by the notification and those 26% uh, that were not surprised knew their risk of exposure uh, greatly due to infections and social networks that are closer and more familiar, which means uh, social networks where the news of an infection potentially spreads faster. So we assume that the app helps to identify the risks that occur outside the immediate environment. Um, most people who were not surprised knew of infection in uh, family members, people at work, uh, or for other reasons, uh, which we don't know who, what those are. People in the care environment of their own children did not play a major role as was su suspected before. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we also wanted to know how often um, participants put themselves in situations that were more like dangerous than, uh, than others from an epidemiological point of view, because the recommendations on minimum distance and duration were not uh, or could not be followed. We asked two, uh, two questions, one about the number of people who were met in this way and uh, in uh, or, or were met in this way in and outside the personal environment. What you see here is the distribution of the number of meetings with people in the personal environment. Nearly half of the respondents had less than one of those contacts per day. So if you click twice, please. Uh, is this? Thank you. So when we compare that to the response distribution regarding contacts with uh, personally unknown people, we see that on average, more people are personally unknown are met per day. More specifically, more people reported interaction with more than three personally unknown people per day than the same amount with known people. Still about uh, half the people report that they interact with less than one uh, personally unknown person per day where they could not keep the recommended distance. So next slide, please. Yeah, to assess the study population, it is also important to know whether and to what extent study respondents take preventive measures to protect themselves from infection. As expected, almost all participants, 99% uh, have integrated infection control measures into their daily routine. Almost all of those who took measures do that by wearing a, wearing a mask, keeping their distance, reducing contact avoiding crowds and washing hands frequently, even if this category was not chosen as often as the before mentioned. Uh, it can be speculated that um, fewer people selected the category of meeting only outdoors, as this may be more difficult uh, in everyday life, thinking of uh, work of, or families living together. 
not touching the face with unwashed hands seems also to be something fewer people do to protect themselves. All in all, the respondents uh, report that they are, or they report that they are very compliant with the official recommendations. So next slide, please. Um, going back to the circumstances, we also wanted to know how often respondents have come into direct contact with people outside their own household because of their job during an average uh, work week in the past four weeks. Uh, respectively, 28% come into contact with people outside their household either daily or almost daily or never or almost never because of their job. The most respondents either have uh, non such contacts or this kind of contact daily. Perhaps this shows the difference between uh, people who can work in the home office and those whom this does not apply. Uh, next slide, please. To estimate um, the risk perception before the, uh, yeah, the high risk notification, we also ask how participants had previously assessed the risk. About 70% assessed the risk to be low or rather low. This uh, is another indicator that the app can help uncover undiscovered risk. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, this could also be due to the participants view that the risk of infection for them is low at a more general level. We don't know that yet. Next slide, please. So yeah, moving on, we have a question about potential change uh, of behavior due to the high risk notification. And again, a uh, filtered follow-up question dealing with the actions one might take. The percentage of people who want to change their behavior is relatively low, which we attribute to the fact that most people have already integrated preventive measures into their daily lives, as we have already seen before. So those who will take further action reported mostly that they will get tested, be generally more careful, that they will reduce contacts even further and that they will wear masks more often. Self-quarantine was less often reported. Next slide, please. Regarding seeking contact to healthcare providers, only 37% reported that they will do so. If so, the respondents mostly reported reported to contact their primary healthcare physicians. So we uh, think that the app's high risk notification is more likely to lead people to deal with the situation kind of on their own at first, for example, by getting tested, rather than uh, showing the notification directly to a healthcare provider. This may explain why coronavirus app is rarely cited as a reason that infections show up at um, health departments. At first glance, the way seems to be that people get tested because of the notification and in case of a positive result, the infection becomes known to the health authorities. Um, so next slide, please. Um, keeping that in mind, we here see the intention to get tested. 68% say they plan to be tested. 17 decided, uh, decide based on medical advice, 4% do not know and only 11% 11, only 11 do not want to get tested. Those who want to be tested plan to do a rapid antigen test first and foremost. Um, next slide, please. Finally, we are crossing the line from the initial questionnaire to the uh, follow-up here. Uh, here you can see uh, the symptoms that were uh, asked in the initial questionnaire. The most people don't report any symptoms in the last few days, um, while general weakness, sniffles, and he uh, headache are the most common ones. So at least two clicks, uh, Justus. Thank you. So uh, when we take a look at the response distribution from the follow-up questionnaire regarding new symptoms, uh, since the high-risk notification, um, we see that uh, uh, more people report that they had uh, no new symptoms. And everywhere the rates drop, except for loss of sense of smell uh, and taste, but on a very uh, small uh, scale, Guran will deal uh, with this uh, symptoms uh, theme separately uh, later in the talk. Um, so on to the next slide, please. Um, if there were symptoms, since the high-risk notification being reported, we asked when the symptoms first appeared. Uh, most of the respondents reported that uh, those appeared more than three days ago. So next, question, uh, next slide, please. 
uh, of course, we asked in uh, the follow-up questionnaire if people actually uh, took a test. Um, so if you uh, click two times, um, please use this. Um, as we can see, uh, or, or as can be seen here, the intention to test was a little different from the reported actual testing behavior. The distributions are uh, surprisingly close to each other on a, a study population base. Most people intended to get a rapid antigen test and most people reported that they got a rapid antigen uh, test. If those people are the same um, over here. Um, so next slide, please. We also asked how many days after the indication of a high risk notification, the respondents uh, took the test. As you can see here, most people did the test two days after the notification, except for the first day, fewer and fewer people had themselves uh, tested later after, noti after the notification. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here we see again a plot showing the distribution of those uh, who have been tested and those who have not. Of the 87% who did get tested, 58% uh, had a positive test result. So we also asked if um, how the, the, the test result was, positive, negative, or inconclusive. Um, yeah, so of those 5.8% who had a positive test, 80.3% uh, shared their test results um, in the CVR or Corona Barn app and thus uh, warned other users. Uh, we see this as one of the first indicators that the app is uh, being used largely as intended, which means that users are using the app as intended by uh, warning other uh, people if they are infected. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And final slide from me. Um, finally, we wanted to assess the speech of the process in which the test results are communicated. Most participants who received their test results via the uh, Corona Van app did so within uh, 24 hours. Uh, the process rarely lasted longer than two days. Um, this is now, um, yeah, I hope this has now given you an overview um, of the two questionnaires and uh, their univariate descriptive results. So uh, next, Guran will go a little deeper into the results. Yeah, thank you very much. And the last part. I just want to say it is already 10. I want to just <laughs> jump in to say, firstly, that for those who are jumping off, that the, this is recorded. And with 21 questions backlogged, we will not get to them all, but we will do some overflow to get to uh, some of the questions, all of which will be recorded. Yeah, thank you very much. So in the last part, uh, we want to focus a little bit on uh, some uh, uh, further uh, analysis uh, showing the interplay between the answers. Uh, for instance, here uh, we see um, Again, the Sankey diagram of this testing flow, and um, I've um, put in here also the, the kind uh, of test which was initially intended by the participant, and we see somehow the change in, 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 uh, in his intention and what he really did, and also uh, a little bit uh, the advice given uh, by the physician or, or the local health authority. And I've also included um, the, whether the, the test result uh, was um, registered and also received uh, via the, the app. And uh, here we see that, um, so that is the, um, the second but last uh, uh, column. Here we see that uh, from the positive uh, cases, um, there were nearly half of them uh, not um, received by the app. And uh, this perhaps also answers the, the former question um, and gives hints that uh, it is really important to have uh, the, uh, the integration of, the, of this uh, 
uh, testing results in the app because here we see um, that uh, the proportion is much higher of sharing if it comes through the app. And on the other side, uh, people tend not to share if, if they don't get it while this uh, while the app. The next slide. And uh, what we can also have a look at is uh, the contacts, um, uh, the interplay between the, the certain kind of contacts. Uh, one might uh, uh, guess that uh, there's some some dependency that uh, people who have lots of uh, unknown contacts also have uh, lots of known contacts. Uh, but here we see um, the concrete uh, picture. Um, so it's it's not so linear here, and uh, actually people tend to have uh, lower uh, lower degrees of contacts, even if they have uh, lots of unknowns. So next slide. So a similar um, analysis uh, can be done uh, for uh, to compare the contacts with known people with uh, those contacts uh, due to to the professional occupation. And, and here we have a similar picture. So the tendency um, is uh, a little bit to, to the lower ones. So next slide. Um, here we finally see the context of uh, unknown um, to, to unknown people compared uh, with those contexts uh, in a professional setting. And here we, we see the similar picture. So all these uh, three putting together, um, we can, so next slide, please. So I, I uh, run a little bit uh, through all these pictures because uh, I think we are already a little bit over time. And um, these pictures might help and uh, actually should be a little bit more digested um, uh, with a little bit more of time uh, to, to see the influences, but uh, actually these uh, pictures might help to, to know um, what's going on here and um, also uh, help in, in modeling some stuff. So as uh, for the behavioral uh, changes here, we see uh, the dependency um, of this uh, multiple choice answers uh, for the safety measures taken and um, here we have, uh, here is nothing special. Uh, this was already uh, somehow uh, visible in the univariate um, version of these data. So next slide, please. Here we uh, see the dependency in the behavioral change. And um, so this is also not too astonishing um, people tend uh, mainly to go to have tests, to have a test. And uh, they also will reduce their contacts and uh, be uh, generally more prudent if they got a warning. And the last slide for the behavioral part is uh, uh, whom they will, whom they want to contact and um, here, we see uh, actually almost no dependence on, on the other uh, questions. So this brings us uh, to the symptoms. Actually, um, here we see, we can see a lot or, or basically nothing. So uh, people have lots of all varieties of, uh, of symptoms. So for me, here's uh, nothing really special visible. But that might help to understand better. Which brings us also to the uh, geographic distribution. Um, in the survey, we ask uh, for the uh, three first three places of the zip code. And um, here we see the distribution of them. And uh, for better comparison later with the, the cases, uh, we have to translate them first uh, to the counties. This is the next slide. And uh, here we see uh, some, some uh, more pink or, or more white or pink uh, spots, uh, which indicates that uh, uh, the participants uh, were more or less uh, mainly from, from uh, 
urban regions. And we can investigate that further, which brings us to the next slide. And here we have plotted um, the rural and uh, the urbans, uh, urban uh, counties together and uh, uh, tried to see whether there's a, a distance, a distinct um, a distinction between them, a difference between them. And uh, we can basically see that there's also uh, a bias uh, of using the app or taking part in the survey uh, if they are coming from a urban setting. So and the final question is, um, is uh, how is this, uh, how's the correlation of uh, receiving a warning uh, to the actual cases? And for that, we've taken the, the top 10 counties here and uh, plotted uh, somehow the, the peaks and, and the distribution and time um, for, the, for the reception or the receiving of the, of the warnings. And we should compare them with uh, a similar plot, which is on the next slide um, for the cases in these uh, counties. And uh, actually here, we might also want to see uh, whether, they, whether they are somehow related, which is done in the next slide. And uh, of course, this is not too astonishing as well, um, but it's uh, always a good idea to check that uh, the expected uh, dependency is here. So the, this is somehow a no brainer, of course, if there are more cases, then there are more positively tested persons, uh, which will warn others, so they should receive warnings. Um, but if we uh, look at uh, the next slide, we also see a similar dependency um, from the warnings uh, five days ago to the cases. And uh, on the next slide, we see a, a similar one um, for a delay of six days related um, to the warnings. Um, and uh, that means that we also get here some, some good uh, correlation um, and finding somehow back uh, the, the known dependency on the, on the incubation time. Actually, this uh, might be a good point here to point out that uh, we, we expect here further uh, insights uh, from the um, uh, from the privacy preserving analytics uh, data, uh, which are much uh, much higher in in, uh, in the number, and um, uh, perhaps we can also um, try to set up some some early warnings with a, with a good predictive value, uh, because uh, the earliness of of this. Uh, um, of these data is uh, and the timeliness of this data is uh, might help us in predicting um, the directions uh, in which uh, the the cases also increase. Yeah, but I think we have uh, tortured the data for the moment enough, and uh, we will see what uh, what comes from from further data. So then uh, let's. Uh, make some conclusions. So the privacy preserving analytics data, data already gives us convincing evidence that the app works quite well. Uh, here we mainly saw that uh, how, ma how many people get warned um, and uh, there were also good data in, in these data sets uh, to see where, where certain dropouts occur and uh, which helps us uh, in improving all the processes. And um, out of the uh, event-driven uh, user survey, um, we got uh, some further insights, uh, especially important uh, for us was uh, to see how many people really get a positive test uh, after a warning, which means uh, these are really correctly warned and uh, also what what their behavior change uh, was and uh, so what uh, what uh, what they did basically and uh, again 
this uh, might help us uh, to, to uh, point out the, the special uh, uh, steps uh, which uh, could be improved uh, in the whole process. So with good data uh, to fine tune the app further, um, we can also improve the uptake and, and improve the processes around um, the app. And we have also good data to uh, compare uh, our findings uh, with the analog contact tracing. But actually here we can also say for the analog contact tracing, we are somehow missing a couple of data. So um, this uh, means that um, uh, given all the restrictions, um, main, meaning that uh, we have a decentralized system, we have a privacy preserving system, um, nevertheless, uh, we can uh, give good indications that uh, and good evidence that the app does really a good job. So what rests is to use it, which brings us to the end and the next slide. Um, and we all are trying to make our contributions in helping the fight against the coronavirus. Thank you very much. So thank you. That was that was a, a fabulous talk. As I said, we are way over time, but we are we will overflow for a while. Uh, so hopefully, I just succeeded in promoting uh, Henry uh, van der uh, Hofter to to ask his question in person about um, about advanced consent. And generally, um, yeah, uh, remember you can keep upvoting questions in the Q and A if you want to see those ones answered. Okay, I unmuted my phone, so I hope this works. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, Are we you can. Yes. Okay, great. Henry Tehofter from Windesheim University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. I uh, collaborated on the Corona Melt Rep in the Netherlands. And I was wondering what would be against uh, asking Google and Apple to uh, further the advanced consent that could be given. Currently, you can only give advanced consent for 24 hours in advance to share your keys. But at the moment that people request a test or register to, to have a test, they could already say something like, well, okay, if, it, if the result is positive, then please share my keys. And then people only need to think about it once. And that would really bother the coronavirus, I think, because it's speedier. And uh, the purpose is to bother the coronavirus and not people. Yeah, well, um, there is actually the possibility to have a five-day advanced consent um, since I believe late last year. So initially, great. Hmm? great. Uh, I, the, the, then I was uh, operating under old uh, information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, initially that was exactly that problem that we also experienced and um, that we got back from from user experience. That means that at the time when you receive a positive test result and you actually have different things in mind now than warning others, you have to take that decision and say, well, I agree to warn others. You have to go at least uh, in the German app through a quite lengthy text uh, 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 where you give your consent, where you learn about um, what it means and then you have to accept that. And many people actually are not in the mood at that time of doing that. And um, yes. We discussed that with Google and Apple and we got to that agreement that you can give your advanced consent up to five days before actually do the upload. So it's it's valid, it stays valid for five days. And that is enough in most of the cases that you can yeah. give it at the time when you register your test and um, within uh, the five days you should usually have done your submission of keys if the test is okay. positive. Uh, the only thing we have to do now for the Netherlands is to convince the makers to actually integrate the, the receiving of the, uh, the positive test results because that's uh, mostly uh, analog in the Netherlands. But great that at least that this is technical possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So and next... actually we, we also have uh, evidence that uh, it, uh, um, the rate of, uh, of sharing is much higher afterwards. Yeah, that's that it helps. So we compared the sharing rates um, before we made that change to afterwards. And we saw that there was really a degree, uh, um, increase of uh, in, in percentage points, almost um, 20 percentage points. So the next question is from Frank Grimm. 
So thank you, uh, Frank Grimm, Bielefeld University. I was wondering whether you considered working with test providers to survey them at test time if the subject was there because they received a notification from the app. I haven't understood the question, sorry. So the um, test providers, um, you mean laboratories or, or who do you mean with test providers or rapid test providers? No, the actual PCR test um, places, ah. like the Danish uh, Smetostop app, they actually survey the people when they get the PCR test, for example, to see whether they are there because of their app. Okay, so so they went to the to the places where people go for testing, and then they uh, question them at that place. Yeah, now we uh, have not done. From that. my understanding, yeah. Yeah, now we have not done that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the next question uh, is from Christian Berner. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sorry, uh, you just transferred me from a watcher to like a speaker, so now I can't see the question anymore. Um, okay, I'll raise your question. You, so it's fairly simple. Why are PCR and other test providers not required and compensated supporters to integrate with the coronavirus app? Well, <laughs> it's just a legal issue so you you can you cannot require them to to do that it's their decision to do it and you can only make it as easy as possible for them um that means um actually approaching all of them and uh, suggesting them uh ready to take solutions so that it's um really easy to and it doesn't mean too much effort for them to do that integration okay yeah i mean have you had resistance there or is yes. it just... Well, re not really resistance, but um, there was some disinterest. So where um, where laboratories wouldn't want to get through that effort. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the government should see the gravity of the situation and always consider mandates, um, if at all possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was never an option to that sure. laboratories would be mandated to. To participate there. Okay, the next question is again from Henry Tehofte, who has lots of good questions. Uh, this one about positive predictive values. Thanks again. Um, I saw a statistic of 4.6%, and I believe that uh, this was a so called positive predict predictive value when you compare the fraction of people that test positive compared to the total number of people that got a notification and uh, get got a test. Is that correct? Uh, no, the 4.6%, the, the that is just the positivity rate um, in all those tests that were processed through the CVR ecosystem. Ah. So that means of those tests, 4.6% were positive in the end. So do you have a predict, predictive positive value for the people that uh, got a notification through your app and tested? And can you, re uh, well, you cannot compare it to the analog testing traces. I, I see that because in the Netherlands, it's 8.2%. And in, uh, in the Nature paper uh, uh, presented just last week, it's 6.0% uh, in the UK and, uh, sorry, actually in England and Wales, I yeah. believe. We, we haven't calculated that yet but we hope that we'll be able to do that soon. Okay, looking forward what, to it. What, what we see is that the proportion of positive tests in people who got a uh, exposure notification is higher. Yeah, but um, how exactly that, uh, that translates into the positive predictive value, we, we have to check. Looking forward. And Luca, did you wanna step in and give more context for that 6%? <laughs> So the, the 6% uh, is basically the, uh, the number of the number of individuals who are notified and then become cases. So it's, I don't know if it's a positive predictive value. It's something that we, I would call the second I case rate rather than the second attack rate, because of course, not all, not all individuals who are actually infected get, uh, get uh, a positive test. 
uh, it's, for us, it was more useful to understand what was the relation between uh, uh, the manual contact tracing and the digital one, because actually the this second IK rate is not so different between the two. So essentially, the apps, at least in England and Wales, are, are not performing so differently from manual contact tracing of not to close contacts. Yeah, we, we actually also thought when you're directly comparing the numbers or the positivity rate of um, contacts um, notified by the app and contacts found by um, analog contact tracing, one also needs to consider that the analog contact tracing tends to find the closer contacts first. So that means a larger proportion of them are household contacts, for example, and they naturally tend to be more exposed and, and exposed over a longer uh, period and more intensively. So you would actually expect more positive uh, cases there. I'll just throw uh, in that like compared to the earliest contact tracing data from the early outbreaks of the, of the epidemic and work that was done in Korea and Taiwan and so on, all of these numbers are really high <laughs> compared to the, the, the very low rates that were once seen in contact tracing. I don't know whether that's the viral evolution or whether that's um, improved infectiousness windows. I know the Swiss rate was three point something. So in some recent work, so that was lower and the risk models presumably matter. I think uh, Justus is right uh, in uh, pointing out that if you pick uh, all contacts, so if you pick only the contacts that are most exposed, uh, even changing the scoring of the app, that matters because you can notify less people with higher probability that they, are, that they have been infected, or you can choose to notify more people, but then you will reduce the second attack rate. So it's, uh, it's not as straightforward. Okay, next question is Andreas Gebhard. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Andreas Gebhard. I uh, was part of the TCN coalition uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, and then uh, I'm working with the Linux Foundation Public Health uh, right now. Uh, my question is a little bit about um, the early days, uh, especially in, in Germany. I remember the um, local health authorities were seemed at least uh, quite opposed to the app. Uh, they were very concerned about increasing workloads. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that they you know, responded very often saying, we don't know what to say when somebody asks us about um, uh, the app or notifications coming from the app. Um, have you been have you been seeing uh, a significant change in in their uh, perception and their reactions and their embrace, if you will, uh, of mm. the app over time? We have seen some change, but we have not really uh, surveyed that. And uh, so it's anecdotic. It's more anecdotical. Um, Gotcha. perception that we have there and we had some rounds where we where we were discussing with local health authorities also about um, uh, their expectations to the app what they would have um, like to have added to it what they want to have changed so that they can make more use of it that was for example when we designed that um, contact uh, diary uh, we did that together with uh, local house authorities, but this was always a selection of interested local house authorities. So we can't really give a full picture of um, all the local house authorities and how their perception has changed. Okay. We Thank know you. that there are still there are still many who think that's best for them if the Corona One app does its work and it's not related to them. Yes, I'm aware of that. I've also seen uh, media reports uh, in, in local uh, German media about uh, changing perceptions and actual warm embrace of the app a few months after it was released. So I was just curious if that had a kind of a wider reflection or if that was just local. Thank you. Okay, I think we are going to wrap up now, even though there are still a huge number of questions. I think that was a fabulous talk that generated so many questions and just really impressive both public health impact and ability to study a system that was designed not to be studied <laughs> um, and just uh, you know amazing work thank you very much for presenting and a reminder to those still here next month June 29th we'll be talking about evolution we'll be talking about new variants and and what that means for for this community so thank you all
and there, there will be a recording, so check out the recording. Thank you. Thank you, Anna.